ladies and gentlemen. Is that, is that working? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I didn't mean to start with a parrot story, but um, <laughs> Barry's got me in the mood. Um, a friend of mine told me this, that uh, you may remember that the Liberal Democrats in one of their relaunches um, had a bird as their symbol and um, depicted it um, as a sort of phoenix. And a friend of mine who was writing speeches for Mrs. Thatcher uh, at the time uh, thought that she should put into her party conference speech um, a thing from the Monty Python dead parrot sketch. Yes. Um, so she said, he put this in, and she said, what is this? And she had absolutely no idea, in any sense, what this could possibly be. Um, and she explained, and um, she said, um, I see, is it funny? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, he said, yes, yes, it's very funny, Prime Minister. And being a thorough woman, she wanted to understand the dead parrot sketch before she included it in her party conference speech. So they got a video around to number 10, and they all sat and watched the dead parrot sketch with Mrs. Thatcher. Um, and because they were very, very nervous, as soon as it started, they all fell around with laughter, my friend and others. They were rolling in their chairs. Mrs. Thatcher completely bewildered by the whole sketch from beginning to end. Absolutely no idea what, what this was about in any sense. She wasn't disapproving, she just had no conception of what this could possibly be. However, they persuaded her this was a very good joke against the Liberals, and she liked jokes against the Liberals, and she said, uh, okay, I'll do it. And she kept rehearsing it again and again, this is a dead parrot, an ex-parrot, it is deceased, all that stuff. And, um, and it was into the, into the script, and for the party conference speech, which was of course a great occasion for her of, of every year, the one she minded most about. And my friend walked down with her, sort of high in the stage as she was about to go on. And she turned to him and she said, John, this Monty Python, is he one of us? At <laughs> <laughs> uh, which point, he thought it was much too late to start explaining. So he said, yes, Prime Minister, he's a very keen supporter. <laughs> And of course, being a great trooper, she performed it absolutely brilliantly, and everybody roared with laughter, and uh, she was none the wiser, but it was a great <laughs> uh, But that wasn't what I was going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk um, just about one thing, because there's so much to say, and we only have a very short time. I thought I'd just pick one a moment, really, which was Mrs. Thatcher going to Moscow uh, in 1987, because it tells you a lot about her character, and it was a very extraordinary event. You may remember that she went, uh, that she had Gorbachev to meet her in Chequers in 1984. That was the beginning of a, a, a sort of beautiful friendship, and it was a good spot by her because he was not at that point, which people forget, a Soviet leader. He was a likely future Soviet leader. He then became Soviet leader the following year, and partly due to Mrs. Thatcher's intermediating with Reagan, things all started to move towards um, de-escalation and trying to get rid of nuclear weapons and so on. And part of all this was um, Mrs. Thatcher persuading Reagan that there were things that could be done and convincing him that Gorbachev was worth talking to. And in uh, March 1987, she accepted an invitation from Gorbachev to go to Moscow. And um, it was turned out to be a very important visit, and she was very conscious that it was an important visit. <laughs> and at this time, relations were very bad all over again between the West and the East. Um, Gorbachev went and saw her ambassador, uh, British ambassador before, and said um, that the Conservatives have the damp, stagnant smell of the prehistoric cave, was how he put it. So he wasn't feeling great about, about them. But she thought that there was a deal to be done somewhere in here about nuclear weapons and the reduction of nuclear weapons, so long as you didn't try to do it all at once, and you, you, you set up a basically a stronger relationship. Uh, and she could see that this was the moment. And typically with Mrs. Thatcher, she prepared very carefully for this. She saw Oleg Gordievsky, the great defector um, from the KGB, who knew what was going on from the other way around, and he briefed her. Though it wasn't an entirely successful meeting, the first one, because for security reasons, she insisted on calling him Mr. Collins throughout, um, so that his cover was not blown, even though it was in number 10, and there wasn't much danger. <laughs> Everyone was very confused about this. Um, she also saw Geoffrey Howe uh, at various meetings, but whenever poor Geoffrey Howe, the Foreign Secretary, tried to open his mouth, she'd say, no, no, Geoffrey, uh, we know what you're going to say. <laughs> um, uh, Gordievsky advised her that when she was going to go on Soviet television, which is very important, and that she should tell the Russian people um, how life was in Britain and why it was better, and he particularly told her to tell them about home ownership, because 
He said they all live in horrible state-owned flats like insects, and in your country, 70% of the population are owner occupiers. So um, tell them this on television, it was good advice. But part of her preparation also for all of this was she always cared very much about the minute things, so she was very concerned about the, uh, what she wore, which perhaps not so, such a, so minute a subject actually, and also what present should be given to Gorbachev. On the latter point, um, the Foreign Office had said um, that, we, that she should give him two silver-backed hairbrushes. But she wrote on the piece of paper, but he's completely bald, which uh, and the Foreign Office hadn't spotted. Um, she then decided um, uh, what, to, what to wear, and she calculated very, very carefully for maximum theatrical effect. She was very keen on clothes, Mrs. Thatcher, and her mother had been a sempstress, and she cared a lot about how she looked at them, and she used them as sort of weapons, which I think is a great mistake that the VMA expressed a lack of interest in them when it came up a few years back, because it tells you so much about the history of this country and power in relation to clothes. And on this occasion, she really went to town, and Crawfee, her sort of great aide on all this, found a, a, a splendid black coat in with the window of Acroscutum, and also a camel hair coat with a, a sable collar, and a, and a lovely sable hat, and beige suede boots, and all sorts of exciting things. Um, which make her look really good. And she knew, Crawford knew, that Mrs. Thatcher was excited by Gorbachev, uh, which, uh, she, who she said had, in Mrs. Thatcher's view, lovely sparkling eyes. And um, that, that she wanted to get the whole thing going and for the world to notice. And she arrived with the black coat in Moscow, uh, with the hat, um, and with a black crocodile skin handbag, and looked, uh, looked terrific, holding a bunch of roses with which she was presented. And all through this visit, you see in all the pictures, you can see it in the book, how she dresses for these occasions. So she went to a monastery to show her support for Christianity against the Soviet uh, communism. Um, and again, she's wearing these lovely beige boots, um, uh, looking very elegant. And she held a candle in the church, a lit candle. Being a Methodist, she didn't know that, that when you light a candle, you're supposed to stick it in and pray with it, but she held it very reverently until somebody explained what to do. And she went round to a a sort of show flat to see what ordinary Soviet life was like, and all the people started to turn up and start to buttonhole her and cheer her and ask her questions as long as she wanted to ask them questions. Uh, and so she started to make a sort of impact on the streets, and again the photographs show that very well. Huge crowds um, started to gather. And then she went to the Bolshoi with Gorbachev that night, um, wearing what's called Eleanor Blacklace, she kept lists of all of this, Eleanor Blacklace evening gown, Eleanor because Lady Glover, Eleanor Lady Glover had lent it to her. And um, uh, that was the first, and then they had a very long, very, very long meeting, seven hour meeting the following day when they argued about everything. And um, what, the way it worked really with Mrs. Thatcher and Gorbachev was that the nature of the strength of their relationship was they, they did argue so much, it was completely unlike normal uh, diplomatic um, discourse. Essentially, she was saying, you know, capitalism is marvellous, we're a free country, um, we have freedom of speech and free markets, and you lot are all oppressed and miserable, and uh, it's time you change. And he was saying um, the opposite, and how wonderful and equal and splendid it was in, 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 in uh, his country. Um, and they had an interesting argument about power, and he said that power in the Western world was a brilliant ballet to fool people about who really uh, had the power, and it was really a few capitalists and in the Soviet Union it was the people. Um, and he said to her, um, you, your party is the party, of, is that completely out of date because it's the party of the, uh, of the haves and you have nothing to say for the have-nots. Um, and she said, no, you don't understand what I'm trying to do. I'm, trying to I'm not trying to create a party of haves, I'm trying to create a country of haves. I want ownership to spread across uh, the whole of the nation. And that's the sort of nature of the argument. Um, and she um, pushed it very hard, and I found the, the sort of record of what Cod, uh, Gorbachev said to the Politburo when he got home, as it were, got out of the meeting. And he said, she's an audacious woman, comrade. She was speaking as if it was, in the, it was like a piece of theatre. Um, and he was very struck by how strongly she was pushing it. Um, but he also was very struck by the fact that she uh, expressed to him for the first time something he hadn't quite understood, which was how frightened the West was of the Soviet Union because of some forms of Soviet adventurism. And so he got a better sense from her of how um, they had to be careful what they did, the Soviets, because the Brezhnev doctrine of always repelling capitalism wherever it got into any 
part of the socialist system um, was frightening to the West. And Gorbachev said, we have to think about this, comrades. Again, in this reporting to his, com to his uh, colleagues, we have to think about this, this really matters. And uh, they had an argument which got fiercer and fiercer. And I'll just give you a quick sense of um, what, how the Russians saw it. Um, there's a, a advisor to Gorbachev called Chernayev, who was there, who was completely in love with Mrs. Thatcher on a sort of sexual basis, really. <laughs> and um, he, he says, she was, as always, extremely attractive, earnest but determined, stubborn, sometimes didactic. He was ironic, sarcastic, at times even abrupt. Gorbachev's belief in the correctness of his cause translated into self-confidence in personal context, even with women. And Thatcher, for all her practical intelligence and astonishing competence, always showed a feminine side as well. She tenderly looked over the men sitting in front of her, as if also making sure about the impression she made as a woman. And I think that is actually quite an accurate uh, assessment of how she was doing it. So she was sort of playing the diplomacy, um, but also very concerned about what people are now rather annoyingly call um, personal chemistry. Um, and the key thing was that she went on television. And for the first time, this was not censored. First time a Western leader had been on television uncensored. And this was um, absolutely struck home with the Soviet uh, people because they'd never seen anything like it. And uh, there's a nice letter, sorry, just find it here, which a young man, Russian man, wrote about what it looked like. And he says, he's this young uh, geologist. He wrote in rather funny but rather expressive English. She acted extremely professional, very attractive, and even sincerely. She was very rational and humanic. Now I often saw ladies dressed and haircutted a la Margaret Thatcher. Because so out in the street afterwards, they were all starting to imitate her, her styles. Um, and then uh, the interviewers, he comments on the interviewers, three huge fat political commentators attacked her. They were untactful, unprofessional, simply rude. The interview was the apotheosis of her visit. And the importance of all of, all of this was that you couldn't go back on it. It made a great difference to the life of the Soviet Union because once you'd allowed a Western politician to do this, and once it was very successful, it was very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. And so she was making quite a difference, I think, to um, what's actually happening in the Soviet Union. She had supper with Gorbachev at the end of all of this, and he took her into a different room for supper to change the mood of the conversation. Um, and he said, and I guess he'd done this before, because um, this was the Soviet guest house, I bet he'd done this trick with other leaders. He pointed to the painting on the wall and he said, uh, this painting uh, is rather like our conversation, Prime Minister. It was a painting of a, a rural scene and it's, after, it's in the afternoon or early evening and it's after storms and there are clouds but they're dispersing and the sun is coming through. He said, it's rather like our conversation, there have been terrible storms but um, there's some light. And Mrs. Thatcher obviously couldn't have prepared this because she hadn't been there before. She, she looked at the painting and she said, yes, Mr. General Secretary, but the light is coming from the West. <laughs> so uh, that was, the, that was the, the sort of way she knew how to... And that, so that though she doesn't have a sense of humour, as I think I've shown um, from the parrot story, uh, she certainly did have a sense of wit and ability to uh, hit back. Um, and uh, she went... Uh, back to England, and this, at the same time something was happening, which was that um, poor Neil Kinnock had tried to go to um, see President Reagan at the same time to counter the Thatcher effect. But what I discovered was, and he, and he did go to see him, and the, the, um, immediately after the meeting, in which President Reagan deliberately said to Dennis Healy, um, nice to see you, Mr. Ambassador. I might have up with somebody else. Almost certainly deliberately. Um, and immediately the Reagan team briefed against Kinnock and they said, because they said the Kinnock account of this meeting is wrong, um, we told him how much we disapproved of him, etc., etc., his unilateralist policy. And I've discovered satisfactorily that this wasn't set up by Charles Hull, her private secretary, with the American ambassador to humiliate um, Kinnock and uh, make sure, make help, make this is actually help, help her win the next election, which she was about to fight. So I just want you to see that at the same time that she was doing something very, um, in a way, idealistic and um, important in big policy terms, she was always being fantastically ruthless at the same time and making sure she'd win the election. She timed it perfectly. Um, these, these, this came together, the humiliation of Kinnock, the, the big move.